January 20th, 1692. Two young girls are seized by uncontrollable fits, screaming out strange utterances, and contorting their bodies into positions so unnatural, it's believed they're the victims of a witch's spell. Overnight, the once peaceful village of Salem, Massachusetts is gripped by fear, fanaticism, and death. Accusations of witchcraft trigger the executions of 20 people. They got rid of people that they didn't like. Now, a bizarre affliction strikes teenage students at a high school built on the same soil where accused witches were hanged. Has a baffling disorder returned after 300 years? In your honor, we build this barrier. And could witchcraft be to blame? Could new evidence finally reveal what triggered this centuries-old mystery? Or will Salem be forever trapped in the shadow of its dark past? My name's Jennifer Marshall. After serving in the US Navy, I began a career as a private investigator. Now, I'm on the trail of something otherworldly. By the power of fire. Decoding the mystery of the Salem witches. So go to me. The infamous story of the Salem witch trials has been an ugly stain on American history for three centuries. But what sparked the madness that turned teenage girls into possessed accusers has never really been determined. That's why a recent incident of high school students exhibiting behaviors similar to the girls of Old Salem is alarming. In 2012 and 13, a high school a few miles from the initial witch trial events experienced a mysterious outbreak. Dozens of students were seized by uncontrollable fits of hiccuping and other bizarre afflictions. It's the kind of story that fuels internet conspiracy theories. Could something supernatural be the cause of both events? Modern Salem still has strong connections to its remarkable history. It's one of the first areas where Europeans settled, but it also has a violent and tragic past. Its historic neighbor, Salem Village, is now called Danvers. And that's where I'm meeting journalist and practicing witch, Sarah Lyons. She's asked me to help investigate if Salem's history of outbreaks is linked to witchcraft. Sarah? Hi, Jen. It's beautiful out here. Nice gray New England day to <laughs> welcome you to Salem. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out. I'm a self-described weirdo. I can't remember a time in my life that I wasn't fascinated by witchcraft and the occult and the paranormal. Growing up in Massachusetts and coming to Salem was one of the things that made me want to be a witch. So where are we? Well, so this is the Salem Parsonage, sort of ground zero for the 1692 Salem witchcraft trials. This would have been the home of the Reverend Samuel Paris. And in 1692, his daughter Betty and her cousin Abigail came down with fits. And when the doctor couldn't find anything medically wrong with them, they blamed witchcraft. And this was the start of the Salem Witch Trials. Right here would have been the foundation of the house. You know, it's a stressful time for everybody, but especially if you're a young girl, this is an incredibly controlling environment to be in. Puritan culture didn't even allow for singing or dancing, correct? No singing, no dancing, not even Christmas. They actually banned Christmas because that was too festive. Sounds fun. So by the end of the Salem Witch Trials, about 150 people had been arrested and 20 had been executed. I think what's interesting is that what happened in the high school in Danvers parallels what happened in Salem. I mean, the symptoms, the age range of the girls, the fact that they were mainly girls, mm -hmm. that's a lot of coincidences in between two incidents that occurred 300 years apart. Absolutely. I'm interested in figuring out what could have triggered both incidents of fits, because bad events like this tend to give witches a bad name. There's been speculation that this area is cursed. As a witch, do you believe in negative energy and curses? Yeah, I absolutely do. I mean, I think that New England is a place that has seen a lot of death. It's seen a lot of injustice done. And I think that that is still very much felt in the very soil that we're standing on. I still have questions about what happened in 1692, but now I'd like to research the high school incident. So I tracked down a woman who was a student during the high school outbreak who can tell us what she saw. 
So you were actually there, and we would like to get an overview of basically what happened at the high school from your point of view. Mm -hmm. One girl in my uh, technical classes, she came in with what just seemed like a case of really persistent hiccups. And this went on for a couple days till we asked her about it. And she was like, yeah, this definitely isn't the hiccups. She said her parents took her to see a neurologist and they said it was something that seemed like Tourette's, but that's weird because that doesn't usually come about when you're 18. How long was it before other students started to exhibit similar symptoms? A couple weeks, maybe. Well, you could hear it in the halls. From what I heard, like, you know, high school rumors, it was all other girls, mostly ones on the soccer team. Given that this seemed to originate and spread throughout the soccer team, did anyone ever talk about maybe it was something in the soil or maybe it was something outside where they were practicing? Did that come up at all? One of the rumors I heard going around was chemicals on the soccer field. Did people start making the parallel? Like, did, were people talking about it in parallel with the Salem Witch Trials? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like most high schools, there's the kids that are obsessed with witches, especially the Salem Witches. Sure. We went to a school that was like where the Salem Witch Trials actually happened, you know? Across the street is the hill that's rumored people were hung on top of. Under the streets, there's tunnels to the old insane asylum. Wait, your school's attached to an insane asylum? In, like, the woods near the school, there were tunnels used to transport, like, tuberculosis patients around. Wow, OK. Mm -hmm. Danvers State is a really, really infamous asylum, a lot of lobotomies. Hearing from someone who was a high school student at that time in Danvers helps me to better understand what really was happening. We need to investigate if something in the soil or something in society triggered these events. This is called the Witch House. It's the only building in Salem that remains to this day with a direct connection to the witch trials. Now, this was Judge Corwin's house, correct? Yes, he was a judge during the witch trial period. And if you were somebody who wanted to bring an accusation of witchcraft against another person, this is the place that you would bring it to. So this is the room that would have been Corwin's study. You know, Judge Corwin here, he used his power as a judge to seize a lot of the property from people that he was accusing of witchcraft. There's been a lot of theories about people accusing another person as a way to get their land or get their house. Pressed to death, what a way to go. When Betty Paris and her cousin first came down with fits and a doctor couldn't find out what was wrong with them, her father demanded to know who had bewitched them. Blame fell to the slave in the house, Tichiba, who immediately confessed out of fear and said that not only had she been practicing witchcraft, but that there were other people doing so in Salem. Soon, other young girls were experiencing the same symptoms as Betty. And soon, Salem as a whole was engaged in a community-wide witch hunt. Yet the thing that caused the girl's behavior from the beginning has never been solved. Spectral evidence is evidence based on visions. Well, that's kind of not evidence. It was one of the main things in the trials at the time that people could say that, you know, they saw your spirit at the foot of their bed, that you sent your spirit to their house. So when these people are accused of this, well, you did A, B, and C, there's no way to disprove something like that. Yeah, back then it was uh, guilty until proven innocent, not innocent until proven guilty. History does seem to repeat itself. The finger pointing of 1692 seems very similar to the online justice mobs of social media today. It's something that I can't look the other way on, the location issue. Most of the original victims of the trials came from Salem Village, which is now modern-day Danvers. The locations just line up too perfectly. Mm -hmm. And you know, we still don't know what actually caused the girls' fits. Or if the same thing caused the high school outbreak. 
I'm interested to get another student's perspective on the whole thing. I mean, I think Allison's point of view is really interesting, but I think you can't just talk to one person about no. an incident like this. No, but I did find a second student to talk to. It'll be interesting to talk to Michael in person, because given that he was a high school student when it happened, and now he's a police officer, he could probably provide distinct points of view about the scenario. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Sarah. Nice to meet you. How many people would you say contracted the vocal tics? It dozens. It had to have been probably upwards of 50. If wow, I had, really? Yeah, you could walk down the hallway and you'd hear in every classroom. What was your thought process back when that was happening? You could see how a 16-year-old would think it was like a joke, think, oh, you know, this is stupid, everybody's making it up. All of a sudden, it exploded and everybody had vocal tics out of nowhere. Were the people experiencing tics afraid of what was happening to them? They were definitely afraid. It was, as you could imagine, embarrassing for them, too. There was people I knew that were having tests done to try to figure out what was wrong with them. There was a few girls who had, like, electrodes walking around in their heads. Wow. And... Could you kind of imitate or tell us what the vocal tics sounded like? Yeah, it was like a really high-pitched, like, screeching noise. It was like, ah, like that. In a higher vocal range. Exactly, yeah. It was definitely higher than that. It was almost like a weird hiccup. It's like, ah. It seemed that it was concentrated on members of the female soccer team. Yeah, right next to the soccer field where the girls played, there was a lot, like the big concentration of construction right in that area. I'm a definite believer in the spirit of place. I practice witchcraft. Was there any local legends associated with the place where your school was? Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff that's happened on that property. Right behind it in the woods, there's these old tunnels in the ground the TB tunnels, tuberculosis tunnels, where they were wheeling like dead, dying people underground. Looking back, I want your view as an adult who works as a police officer as opposed to a 16-year-old high school student. I honestly feel like an environmental factor would make sense. My friends and I were sitting in class one day and these people walked in with these big giant machines testing air quality. There was news channels showing up at the school, going to people's houses. The administrators told us, like, under no circumstances are you allowed to speak to anybody about this. They threatened us with punishment if we talked to, like, the media. It was interesting when Mike told me that the administration tried to stifle any conversation about it. You can't talk to the press. That, to me, you have to look further into it. I'm interested to hear more about that. It sounds like the school kind of tried to cover it up, and that is really fascinating to me. That's the vibe I got, too. This is a real New England-only site. It's the old Salem burial point. It's one of the oldest cemeteries in the region. You don't see headstones like that in California. No, no, no. So there's a local witch that I've been wanting to meet. I think that she'll have an interesting perspective on the outbreaks in town. Oh my Hi. god, thank you for seeing yeah, us on this cold day. No, right? Hi, how Hi. are you? I'm Jennifer. Sarah Frankie, nice to meet you. So we've been researching the events of 1692, and as I understand it, you actually have a direct ancestral connection to those events. Absolutely. During the time of the Salem Witch Trial, all of the people who were executed for witchcraft were not allowed to be buried on hollowed ground. And actually, my ninth great-grandfather, his name was Caleb Buffum, helped people locate the bodies of their loved ones and then take their bodies out of that mass grave so they could take them to a better place where they would have a more respectful burial. That's a powerful answer ancestor to have. Totally. Wow. Well, it took a lot of courage given what was going on at the time. I mean, that's a very honorable thing that he did. And Absolutely. It's good to know that there were people here in Salem trying to do the right thing, too. Bridget Bishop, the first person executed for witchcraft, was a landowner that was very controversial during this time. Sarah Good, she was a homeless person. They got rid of people that they didn't like first. What kind of women would be accused? Women who were outspoken, women who didn't fit societal norms. I mean, just having red hair could have been an indicator that you were a witch. Ooh, I would hang. <laughs> I have so many. Really, I think what fueled the Salem witch trials was a lot of greed and people wanting things that weren't theirs. But it's something that happens around the world every single day, when fear and hatred rule our thoughts and actions. What do you think were the similarities between what happened in Salem in 1692 and what happened recently in Danvers? Hysteria whips people up. People in that age group tend to read off of those things. And even I feel like that energy is left in the soil almost in this area. You can definitely feel it. 
So I know you guys have a lot of interest in what witchcraft really is. Would you like to join me for a ritual later? What do you do at a ritual? We cast a circle and raise up that energy and send out that energy to the universe. I don't have to participate, I can just watch? Totally. Sure. All right, we'll give you the good seats. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm not super familiar with what witches do. But they've been persecuted for centuries, and understandably, they want to clear their name. I'd like to see what it is about their practice that causes people to blame them for bad events. We all depend on the dead for our livelihoods, and we have to remember that what we do is that connection to the dead. Let the dark goddess bless these waters. So, so be. I strike this blade with the light of the universe, and with it stir the waters of truth. You know, witchcraft isn't for everyone, but I hope that Jen realizes that this is a very real and a very powerful thing to a lot of people. To the north, I call upon the element of earth. So mote it be. So mote it be. What did I get myself into? So mote it be. So mote it be. One of the reasons I love witchcraft and I love magic so much is the connection that it gives me to other people through our bond of magic. Pippin, this is your fire, this is your home. Enjoy some of the warmth. In the ritual itself, we cast a circle, we drew in power, and then we release that power back out into the universe. We're charging this fire for power and for honor. I cast a circle to protect us from all negative and positive energies and forces that's compatible with the energies raised herein. So what it be. So what it be. And I wish to thank and honor my ancestors and all of our ancestors. And may we move past their trauma so that the scars of the past do not continue to persist into the future. So what it be. So what it be. Rebecca Nurse, we stand here now. Sarah Wilds, George Jacobs, and Martha Carrier, in your honor, we build this barrier. Let us tell the world your stories, John Willard, Giles, and Martha Corey. In your names, we send the fire of love and truth and knowledge higher. Mary do we meet, Mary do we part, and Mary do we meet again. Thank you for allowing me to observe that. If you could pick one word, what would it be? Wow, I would say, I would say captivating. Yeah. Welcome to Salem. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say led you to wanting to become a witch? I was just taught from a young age, you're not gonna go anywhere in life. I like the idea that women are extremely powerful and we have these ancient stories about how we raised all this energy and how magical and, and fierce we can be. Oh man, I yeah. love that. <laughs> so motivated. So motivated. So motivated. I wanted to be respectful of their beliefs. Witchcraft appears to be alive and well. So if you practice it, certainly you want to make clear that these outbreaks were caused by something else. I have to be honest with you, I'm not knowledgeable about witchcraft, but it is something that I don't understand and I find very odd. I think to understand witchcraft, it's important to understand first what magic is. So we create reality just as much as reality has an impact on us, so that our perceptions have a noticeable effect on the lives that we live and the way that we go about the world. So I do it by incense and spell books and... To me, a layperson, burning incense is just making a room smell good or smell stinky. It has power because I believe it has power. In my opinion, facts don't really matter as much as we all want to think that they do. We are creatures of myth and of story and of belief. I totally understand Jen being skeptical of this world. It's weird, it's mystical, and it's hard to understand. So what's your take on it right now? What do you think happened? 
I am very intrigued to look at this case, especially because of what happened in Danvers somewhat recently. When the ex-students both mentioned that the school is near an old insane asylum with tunnels underneath it, I was very dubious of any connection. But Danvers State Hospital was actually built on land once owned by a witch trials judge known as the Hanging Judge. He was fervent to stomp out signs of witchcraft. Did he take the land for himself? Maybe there was some sort of link. Right, it seems kind of like something you could investigate. It's something that I can't look the other way on, the location issue. I think Salem is a town that seems incredibly cognizant of their role in history. I think this interview is gonna be really interesting. So the author we're gonna meet next, Katherine Howe, she's made some interesting connections between the two events. Catherine Howe is an author who writes fiction, but she's also a historian. And her books are generally set in the Salem area. They talk about witches. Hi, I'm Catherine. Hi. Welcome to the Rebecca Nurse Homestead. It is beautiful out here. This house was built around the 1670s. Oh my, this is not made for us tall people, is it? <laughs> this is the home of Rebecca Nurse, who was accused of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. The reason that the ceilings are so low was for heat conservation because in the 1690s, it was even colder in New England during that time period. Rebecca Nurse did not get along with her neighbors. Because of this, she was executed for the crime of witchcraft. Accused of witchcraft, Rebecca Nurse declared, I'm innocent, and God will clear my innocency. So right now we're investigating the 1692 Salem Witch Panic and its possible connection to the incident at the high school in Danvers in 2013, which I know you wrote a book that has a very similar premise to that. Your novel Conversion is actually set in Danvers, but you were inspired by an event that happened earlier in New York, right? I was. I was inspired by a similar outbreak that happened in Leroy, New York. That was when a group of girls became very physically ill. They had sort of weird tics and weird problems, and no one could figure out what was wrong. What had happened was the girls had conversion disorder, and that's where you are under so much stress that your body converts it into physical symptoms. And when it happens in a group, that's called mass psychogenic illness. Obviously, I was thinking about the adolescent girls who kicked off the accusations at Salem. Right. Given the gender politics of the time and that women were to be seen and not heard, how do you think that factored into the fact that females were finally being listened to? Imagine if your job at 11 is to do housework all the time and not have any playtime or anything like that, and then all of a sudden something happens where Everyone in your community is suddenly paying attention to you and saying, oh, don't worry, don't do any work right now. We're all gonna focus on you. How seductive of an inversion of power is that? It gives incentive for the behavior to continue and well, probably escalate. Taking that information into consideration, mass psychogenic illness is something logical that we have to consider. Could it have caused either the 1692 or the high school outbreak? Conversations with two former students suggest the outbreak at a recent high school in Danvers may be linked to the strange behaviors that sparked the Salem witch trials. I've repeatedly heard there's something weird about the area surrounding the school. With so many theories floating around, I need to see if the high school students who came down with fits a few years ago were victims of something in the soil. We need to check to see if this was environmental. Both students said that most victims played soccer on this field. And because Salem has such an odd history, I'm taking a second sample from the cemetery, which is not far from the foundation of the original home of the Salem outbreak. I'm going to have the samples analyzed to see if there's anything unusual in the soil. All right, I'm wicked excited to show you this. I have an idea for something that might help aid this investigation. Witches have our own version of forensics, and I think it might help Jen gain some additional insight into what it is we're trying to uncover here. Hey guys, how are you? Hi. Hi.
one of the great things about witchcraft stores is it gives us the opportunity to educate people about some of the things we believe. Now, these are all things we use for our magic, things we use to gather information, just like the tarot, actually. You know, the tarot is used to gather information about things that we're kind of working through, uncovering. Would you like to try it? I think you should. <laughs> Were you willing to try it? Mm. Sure. You only live once, right? The tarot is typically 78 cards that are pictures of our lives, things we go through on an everyday basis. So how do we use these as a tool to actually get to a specific conclusion? Is that possible? This isn't where I would go if I'm looking for a scientific answer, but if I'm looking for guidance along a path or if I'm looking for a spiritual insight, this is a tool that I would use for that. I am interested in seeing if a reading is possible to shed more light on the investigation that we're doing. Is that something you do? Sure, let's see what they say. So where you are right now is the priest, okay? And the priest is talking about a couple of different things. It's talking about finding yourself, finding balance. Right now, you guys are trying to find your bearings. You're trying to figure it out, trying to draw conclusions, because not only is the priest centered with himself, he's centered with nature, he's centered with logic, he's centered with all of those different things. And the Queen of Swords, I think, is very much representative of you, being um, very focused on knowledge, focused on finding the truth. Oh, Jen has big Queen of Swords energy, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. I definitely see you as more of a page, just because you have a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> and where you're going. Okay. So the Knight of Cups. Now, knights are really important. They're the people that are the most motivated, and you know they're gonna get the job done. The only person preventing you guys from finding out the truth, finding out the information that you want, is yourselves. So if we're not able to solve this case definitively, it's, it's only because your fault. I stood in my own way. <laughs> you only have yourself to blame. <laughs> were the original accusations made out of malice? Mm. No. The people involved, mm -hmm at this in the beginning was at a very innocent place. They were people who felt like they had the whole world ahead of them. That's where it changed because the people around them had a different idea of where they were going. It was interesting to do the tarot card reading. Do I think that it shed any light on the investigation? Absolutely not. Was it fun for entertainment? Sure. We've heard conflicting theories about what triggered the Salem outbreaks. To cover more ground, Sarah and I are splitting up to investigate alternate leads. Former students suggested that the outbreak at their high school might have been connected to exposure to something on the grounds of the campus. To see if there are any abnormalities that could trigger such an event, I've brought soil samples collected from two spots in Danvers to American Analytics, a leading environmental and chemotherapy contamination testing lab. All right, let's get these logged in so we can start your analysis right away. Sounds good. We analyzed for chromium, lead, arsenic, mercury, metals that are known to be highly toxic and carcinogenic. The soil sample testing is complete, and I'm really curious to see the results. Hey, Tally, what'd you find? Very interesting. Yeah? In particular, we found elevated concentrations of arsenic. I've brought soil samples collected from two spots in Danvers to American Analytics, a leading environmental and chemotherapy contamination testing lab. We do have your laboratory results. Okay. We found elevated concentrations of arsenic. In the sample that you had labeled Cemetery 1, we did find concentrations of 47 milligrams per kilogram. That seems very high. Well, the EPA screening levels are between 0.27 and 0.68 milligrams per kilogram. And so the sample tested 0.47 or 47? It was 47. So is it possible that you could have elevated levels of arsenic, not from contamination, but from the geology of an area? It is possible. Oh. Typically, we see elevated levels like these of heavy metals from major industrial processes. And what did the results from the soccer field show? 
the levels of arsenic were still above the EPA screening levels at 12 and 11 milligrams per kilogram, respectively. The numbers were really alarming. When you have a screening level that's below one and then you have samples that are 11 and 12 and 47, that to me, you have to look further into it. One of the most famous accusers is Ann Putnam, who at just 12 years old accused 62 people of witchcraft. Later in life, Anne made a formal apology for her role in the witch trials. I'm wondering if there's anything in her apology that sheds light on what triggered the incident. The Danvers Archival Center has many rare manuscripts from the witch trial period. And like a lot of people in the area, archivist Richard Trask has a personal connection to 1692. As I understand it, you are one of the main people who've gone around collecting documents pertaining to the trials. Is that right? I've been involved in one way or another in the witchcraft uh, since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I found out uh, early on from my grandparents that I was related to Mary Esty, Rebecca Nurris's mm -hmm. sister. Wow. And Mary was hanged. If you live around here and, you know, can trace your roots back to the original settlers, Almost everybody's related to uh, accusers and accused. This has just been a story and a piece of history that's fascinated me since I was a kid. As I understand it, what you have right here includes a confession from Ann Putnam herself. Right. This is the original volume, and everything inside is the original paper. So this section up here, the top third, a signature at the bottom by Ann Putnam. Oh. In 1692, she was one of the chief accusers, 12 years old. And this is her confession of forgiveness so that she can become a full church member of the Church of Christ at Salem Village. I desire to be humble before God, that I, even being in my childhood, should by such a providence of God be made an instrument for accusing several persons of a grievous crime, whom now I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time. Always with the caveat that the devil made me do it. Right, just following orders, just following the devil's yeah, orders. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about how property factored into accusations of witchcraft back then, people accusing another person as a way to sort of get their land or get their house. No, that, that, that wasn't the case. The state could take all of what's called your movable estate, mm. your cows, your wedding ring, your furniture, but they couldn't take your land. Some of the reported levels of toxic metals were alarmingly high. So I'm meeting with geologist Kazara Berg to interpret what the test results mean. So when I went to Danvers, I took a few samples from the soccer field itself, and then a few from a cemetery, which is about five miles away. I'd love for you to look at these results. Okay, I'll take a look. Out of the four samples from the cemetery, it seems that two are on the lower end. They both have 8.7 milligrams of contaminant to one kilogram of soil. The other two out of the four have 47 and 39. Now, when I was in the lab talking to Tally, I thought that the 47 seemed to be excessive. What is the natural range that occurs in Massachusetts? Well, upon first glance, it seems kind of scary. Massachusetts actually has a range of seven to 40. Seven milligrams over kilograms. That is considered naturally occurring. Anything higher than that is environmental factors from humans like agriculture, pollution. So what do high levels of arsenic mean and what risk does that pose to the population living there? neurological damage, neuromuscular damage, but that is actually being exposed to high levels of it over a long duration of time. Is it possible that prolonged exposure to a heavy metal could cause somebody to have neurological damage, to act out? I mean, we have cases in history where that has happened. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, mad as a hatter? Mad as a hatter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so back in the 17th and 1800s, they would use mercury in the hat making process, and they actually ended up showing signs of dementia. But that is an example of prolonged exposure to high concentrations, though. Right. Because he was literally working with mercury with his hands every day. Let's talk specifically about the samples that were taken from the soccer field. If you're looking at 11 or 12, in your opinion, would that be enough to cause things like vocal tics, outbursts, hiccups? I don't believe so, because the way to get arsenic poisoning, the most common way, is ingestion. And I doubt these high school girls are eating handfuls of the dirt every day during practice. If it is from the groundwater, let's say if it leached from the soil into the groundwater, I feel like more people would be affected instead of just isolated incidents at the same high school. 
you would be seeing these sort of things throughout Massachusetts and not just in this one particular area. Exactly, yeah. The soil test results did not convince me that the high school incident was triggered by something in the environment. But I do have another lead I want to follow up on. Dr. Robert Bartholomew is a medical sociologist who studied this incident in depth. I've always been interested in bizarre behavior. and. Uh, an outbreak of hiccuping at a school for over a year is pretty bizarre behavior. Now, how would you compare and contrast what happened at Danvers as compared to what happened in Old Salem? It's the same phenomena. It's just a different cultural setting that has colored the symptoms. Motor symptoms, that's what the vocal tics are. And once these start, you get an imitation of behaviors. And that's what was going on in Salem as well. So do you believe in demonic possession or do you think that's more of a cultural issue? Very clearly, it's a cultural phenomenon. And if you think you've been possessed by a demon, to you it's real. Now you're going to act and behave like it's real. And in Salem in 1692, this would have been absolute proof that there are demons and the devil is amongst us. Medical sociologist Robert Bartholomew believes he knows the true cause behind both the 1692 witchcraft trial and a 2012 outbreak at a high school near the site where the witch hunt started. It's important to realize the phenomena that we're looking at. Mass psychogenic illness, AKA mass hysteria, is essentially a collective stress response. What are the real symptoms of mass psychogenic illness? Typically, they are headache, nausea, twitching, shaking, altered states of consciousness, but there's nothing physically wrong with them. It's the power of the mind and the power of an idea. I think the girls had a mass clinical hysteria. These people believed that they were being afflicted. Do you see any parallels between 1692 and what happened at the high school in Danvers? Absolutely. You look in the papers, this happens around the country periodically, usually involving young people, often girls, usually when they're clustered together. What's very frustrating to me is the Massachusetts Department of Public Health covered up this case. When I got the Freedom of Information Act documents, it became clear to me that the Massachusetts Department of Public Health clearly knew that this was an outbreak of mass psychogenic illness. And why do you think they chose to omit that information from the final report? Well, because mass psychogenic illness is a diagnosis that is often met with disbelief and anger by parents. No one likes to think that their son or daughter is hysterical. All of those institutions can fail us at one time or another. And in 1692, all of them failed these innocent people. Right. There's an important story here when you go searching for scapegoats. There's an old saying, look for the devil and he will appear. Hey, Jen. What you got here? So I kind of wanted to set this all up so we can see where we came from and where we are now. Okay. So we have the Paris house, which of course was the location of the first incident. And we have the witch's house. So this is Ann Putnam's house. At the Danvers archive, I actually got a chance to learn a lot more about her. Got the Salem village map, which is now of course Danvers. And this is really interesting because you have the A for accusers, D for defenders, W for witch. And it kind of supports the land grab theory. When you look at this, you can see most of the accusers live on one side of this line, and most of the defenders and witches live on the other side. So there may have been a divide in the town, but it turns out no one lost their land. Then we've got Danvers State Hospital, which of course you have the tunnels underneath that the TB infected patients were transported through. Supposedly haunted. <laughs> That's unconfirmed. But there are some things we can pin down. I got the soil samples back. So, they tested for heavy metals that are known to cause developmental issues. For arsenic in particular, the EPA screening level is under one milligram per kilogram. The cemetery showed that it was a 47, and it used to be located near a tannery, so there were lots of heavy metals being used. Okay. 
The soccer field came at an 11 or 12. Right. The geologist explained that in Massachusetts, there is naturally occurring arsenic anywhere from 10 to 40. Okay. It does just seem like such a high number that I can't imagine it doesn't have some sort of effect on people. Interestingly, I talked to Dr. Robert Bartholomew. He's a medical sociologist. So he alleges that the Massachusetts Department of Public Health engaged in a cover-up. So when they released the report, it was incomplete, and they said it was a normal prevalence of tick phenomenon. Weird. He stated that the Massachusetts Department of Health knew that it was mass psychogenic illness, but would not state that publicly. Wow. You know, the public has a right to know that. Now, what did you hear when you went to go speak to the archivist? I actually got to look at the confession of Ann Putnam and actually touch her signature, and it was a incredibly religious and punishing society. And lots of people died because of her. And later in life, she writes out this long confession. But even in the confession itself, she kind of blames the devil for her actions. And why did she finally write a confession? So she writes the confession because she wants to be let back into the church. For her not to be a part of the church really meant that she was exiled from that society. Do you think witchcraft was to blame in either 1692 or 2012? In short, no. I am someone that believes that things like possession or being compelled by spirits is a very real thing. I mean, I think that in both instances, I don't see the motive behind a witch cursing or hexing any of these people. The incidents in 1692 and 2012, are they related? Yes. It all comes back to mass psychogenic illness. And if we don't talk about it, this could happen again and again. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we keep finding new witches to hang. There's been plenty of instances throughout American history of people blaming a group of people for problems that that group of people weren't really causing and putting all of their ill will onto them. Do we necessarily know what sparked either of these events, the origin? No, but they were not witches. They were not possessed by demons. Both incidents appear to be cases of mass psychogenic illness. We need to know what to do when it happens again.